Okay, I'm gonna kick off the final session of the day for Infigo. Um, I'm gonna introduce Douglas first of all, if you don't know him. Next slide please, Douglas, real quickly, thank you. This is Douglas, um, there's a boring bio there about him. Um, that's not why we work for Douglas, we work for Douglas for many other reasons. Quite an interesting and rare find is Douglas. Um, calls himself an engineer, semi-creative, and a bit, of a bit of a technical gig. Actually, all of those things are true, and that's what makes him Figo so special, because he has an understanding or broad uh, concept of a complete workflow. So, um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why um, Figo is so successful. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> I'll let you introduce yourself, No, Chris. no, you're short ten. No, no, go on. Short ten. Hi, I'm Chris, head of global marketing for Infigo. Love what I do, love our product, love our customers. That's it. So we're here, we're here to talk a, a little bit about um, what it is to develop um, a digital strategy um, that allows you to compete in this sort of crazy world that we live in. Um, and ultimately it's about producing something that's repeatable um, and something that you can um, use a bit of science behind rather than just looking at your sales process an e-commerce business as a standard way of growing and developing your um, business. So we've created this framework and it's something that has evolved over the last 18 months, two years um, to help our customers um, that use our software but it's also um, very, very repeatable for customers that haven't yet moved over to the, the bright side of Infigo um, on developing their business. So we need to look at how we can move away from a very traditional process of having a salesman knock on doors, driving leads and developing their business. Um, to be able to achieve um, efficient growth and build what I would class as some stability um, into, into the organization something that we can easily manage and then obviously drive scale. Um, <clears throat> we need to change from the typical ways that we've always done business and print is a great creature of habit um, for many, many good reasons, but the world is starting to move at a much faster pace and how we grab and, and, and generate customers an opportunity um, is, is very different. Um, and a lot of businesses are keen to look at how we can do this in, in different ways and we'll put this um, hyper growth strategy together to actually help our customers scale, not just in our product, but within the general sales and the business. Um, and we've all done a great work on bringing digital kit into the business. Um, we've maybe looked at automation, we've talked a lot about automation today, um, but how are we using digital transformation to improve and drive growth within within the business. So we've de developed this um, hyper growth framework um, <clears throat> and it is trademarked. If you look up, the trademark is 653812654122358.66. So if you just want to look that up, it is trademarked. <clears throat> but it's really, um, it's about adoption within the business, it's about adoption with the new clients. So the who, the how, the what, and the review. So if we look at um, the pillars of how we can adopt a digital strategy, how we can adopt growth, um, and we've heard from a couple of our customers and, and, and customers of, and Focus and Esco today of how they're growing their businesses, and you've got the likes of, of Bluetree and, and others that have developed an online strategy. So we need to look at how we can bring that within our core business. So we look at this in, in a couple of ways. So the who, so who in the business owns the proposition of taking that to market? Who in the business can sell and demonstrate your proposition? Who in the business can set up and train and support? Because without that who, then a lot of these ideas and plans just fall flat in the face and it just becomes um, a, 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 an idea and not a great execution. So we then look at the how, how do we sell it, how do we onboard it, how do we change the business. 
um, to allow the adoption? Um, how do we manage it now and in the future? And how do we scale that? So we've got lots of customers that want to on board. Roger mentioned earlier on that it's great, but I'm now building lots of these sites. So how can I scale that process as well? <clears throat> the what, what is it that we're selling? And very much today, which I'll touch on a little bit more, is about the brand. How are we representing ourselves? How are we representing the solution? What is it we're offering the clients? What does that look like? How can we um, take that to market? How are we going to target those particular customers? Who are the customers we want to target? What's it called? What's included in the package we're selling? And then probably the most important is the review. And this all categorically um, gets forgotten about every single time. How are we reviewing the success? How are we reviewing um, the, the progress? What are we doing? Because a lot of these strategies get um, pushed away once the business as normal comes in. So putting things like the review, how's it going? And not just within the business, but actually with your customers that are using the software. Um, I'd be interested to hear how many of you guys are, are doing client surveys to see how they find you, how easy it is to do business with you and, and things like that. Um, I don't know, how, how many put your hand up if you're doing things like customer surveys to your customers? Apart from Alex. <laughs> so maybe a couple, but it's, it's amazing actually how we're not asking a customer. And <clears throat> I was speaking to a business in, um, in the US a few weeks ago and, and the, the CEO said to me, Doug, he said, fairly big business, 100 odd million turnover, he said, Doug, he said, we've become really difficult to do business with. And when he actually went out and did a review before he'd taken on our, on our software, um, the feedback was they loved the product, they loved what they did, but it was really difficult to interact with them. And because he hadn't got this review process in, it was just, well, I'm bought, I bought the latest machinery, I'm doing the latest finishing, but he hadn't had built that review. So it's a really important piece um, of, of the, the jigsaw. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's take a little deeper dive into the, the, the who within within the business. So to make things a success, and this is definitely something that really is, is who's going to manage the system, who's going to manage the process of what goes on. And that, that can take a number of levels within the business. So you might have somebody technically that handles the day to day, but then who sells that? How do they sell that? What does that mean? Um, and these things are really important because, because without identifying somebody within the business that has those responsibilities with targets, with demonstrable value to their customers, then they're going to be really lost um, with being able to put a framework and a, a strategy with this. Um, so they really need to be um, detailed. You need to align who that person or people is going to be and then you need to be able to start and put some alignment in what what we're actually delivering so we've got those demonstration things everybody says right we've got these software we've got this product who's going to demonstrate it oh well it can be the tech guy but then the tech guy does a demonstration now he's not doing setup and now the setup's getting and getting delayed and but he's doing lots of demos but you're not you're not fielding that ability to then um, scale the business so it's having that foresight in that thing to actually think about these things as we develop how do we install as the customers um, um, on board what does that time frame look like how often do we are we setting that goals and that that detail together with our customers and, and this could be a delivering a b2b solution it could be delivering a b2c solution it could be delivering just a single template but having that that, that framework, both internally and externally shareable with your customers, um, is really important. And then once the system is up and running, who will be working with the customer? Um, my, my, my theory is it's probably the tech guy again, is now, he's done the demonstration, he's now um, done the install, and he's probably now taking the customer through that process. And the reality is if you want to scale and get growth, you need to start and break that out in the business. And customers often come to me and say, Doug, 
I've got, we've got five or six customers, we've got 30 customers, but I want to get 50 customers, I want to get 100 customers. And what you often find is in, is in different businesses, and it doesn't just, it isn't just a small business, it's also the larger businesses, they haven't identified to multiple people that can support and grow the process. So it's really developing that, that who um, within the business. And I'm going to kick over to Chris just to talk a little bit about the what and the brand and stuff like that as well. Um. Yeah, so um, this is pivotal for whether it's B2B, for your customers, or for a B2C, for a project of your own. Before you can go to market, you need to understand what your message is, how you want to wrap that up, what solution um, you're selling, and what problem you're going to fix for your customer or your customer's customer. Um, Alex showed earlier on a new brand of ours uh, from Figo Eco. We're trying to identify very quickly, visually, and by reading the brand as well. It says what it does very, very quickly. Um, but then the key thing is moving from the brand, where you're going to find the ideal customer, or where you're going to help your customer find the ideal customer. Um, what kind of tools do they need? Do some market research. Find out what kind of um, budgets need to, you need to uh, attain in terms of marketing and reaching those customers. It might be um, a new venture you're looking to launch, um, like a, a side B2C project, or again, you might have a customer that's come to you and said, I want to launch a site for this, how can you help me, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you, you get the numbers, do the research, and also be open-minded. Don't always think about going for the, um, the, the standard channels. There could be a certain product that might be reachable on a different platform that you've never thought of. So, Maybe get somebody from the outside in to give you a little bit of intel on that particular uh, client persona. Yeah, I think that's really important. I was, was with, um, spend most of my time um, in front of the customers these days. I should be in your team, Greg. Can I have a job? See. I'll send you my CV. Um, and, and talking about um, what, what it is, and, and the customer developed this really cool proposition, um, bought a new piece of kit. Um, and as, as, as what normally happens, I bought this new bit of machinery, how can I now sell it? Uh, rather than, oh, let's sell this, this service and we might get some kit to go with it. Always the, uh, always the slight the other way around. And I was asking them about, well, how are you going to go after the, that particular customer? And the discussion was, right, well, I've got John the salesman, he's brilliant, he's going to be in there, he's going to be knocking doors. And, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I said, so you want to go after, and it was financial services customers. I was like, so has John got any relationship in there? No, he's never spoken to them. I was like, so you're going to get how many of these customers? And, how, and they wanted to on board. Roughly, it was about 200,000 worth of print a month to, to make this um, a justifiable um, process. So poor old John's now got this enviable task of knocking on doors. Ring, ring it. I was like, well, what about using LinkedIn? Because we can very quickly... Um, get to those guys very quickly and he's like what do you mean LinkedIn that's just a networking I can't get leads from that and we start to, to talk about right well for your different customers you're gonna have to have different channels to market you can't just be that traditional way of well I'm gonna use this way I'm, I'm gonna use that way so <clears throat> we actually put some ideas and thoughts around those different concepts we introduce some, some tooling and um, that you can automate some of that LinkedIn process identify the list of these customers and he was able to start and drive within very very quick time um, some, some leads and stuff like that whereas normally the traditional process so it's important that <clears throat> you formulate this into some sort of strategy um, and ideas that are not written down will never happen and ideas that are written down that don't have a plan you'll never be successful and you'll never get to scale so you need to make sure that once you've got the people, you then support that with a business plan. And I'll be keen to hear from the, 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 the you guys on how many new ideas you support with a business plan. If you don't want to put your hand up, you obviously don't have to. But in your, so you've got a new year coming up, maybe January. How many guys, how many people are putting a business plan together to talk about new ideas and, and, and new thoughts? Maybe a show of hands. Love that. It's, it's amazing, um, and I'll take that as, as just embarrassed that you don't want to just be the one that puts the hand up all the time. But it's, it's absolutely mental that the, there's maybe 
uh, uh, and this customer, so they worked out they had 200,000 pounds to generate print. I was like, okay, brilliant, fantastic. 200 grand that's gonna drive million pound plus a year. Um, how, many, how many people do you need to speak to to get to that 200,000? What do you mean? I said, I just need 200,000. Well, you're gonna to have to get some metrics that you're gonna to need to speak to 10 people that will get you one lead that will drive that opportunity. Absolutely blown away. It was like I was just talking, but he's just invested several million pound, understood that he needs 200,000 to drive it, but no strategy or business plan to then support that. And what, what I sort of start to say to these is, they're almost become silos or buckets and that you have to put these things in place. And when we talk about it, it's quite obvious, but the reality of driving this into the business and then in through the business and the people to run this in the business is quite new to a lot of customers we speak to. So this is something that I'm really pushing home because without a business plan, we can't get the RI, we can't get the success and, and things like that. And I guess, Chris, <clears throat> one of the things, we obviously have a fairly automated sales process. I don't know if you maybe want to talk about what we actually do at Infigo to attract new business. How yeah. do, what, what's my, no, my, my magic wow. pressure? First of all, we like to work by numbers, Douglas, don't we? Science. So, science. Turn marketing KPIs, into numbers. a science. Yeah. Uh, I think second of all, to, to back up that point of KPIs, numbers, science, we need to know what we don't know. So that, again, I come back to product um, research, customer persona, understand where those target customers will be. So making sure you're going to the right places again. Douglas mentioned uh, LinkedIn as a tool. Um, we're not just talking posting on LinkedIn. There's many third party tools that fit into LinkedIn that will look for job title, um, you know, company, sector, et cetera, et cetera. So you can literally drill it down to a label converter in North America in this state and you can focus on those verticals. I think the other thing as well what we try to do is when we've engaged with somebody that we then analyze that data as well with engagement and then work out a follow-up plan. So we don't just send somebody an email and then just hope for the best. We have step three, step four, step five um, processes as well. And then the other thing as well is, is how, how are we spending Douglas's marketing budget, um, which is uh, painful for you to watch when I'm spending your money. No, because I know the returns <coughs> I'm going to get, Christopher. But, um, <laughs> but again, we have a bit more foresight because we've done the market research, we've engaged with customers, different, different partners to find out what's going on. And then finally, I'd say, again, I mentioned partners, we speak to partners mm -hmm. regularly and we find out what they're doing. Um, yeah. So something we've learned from our time in America where it's a bit more communal, people share a lot more information. Uh, in the UK, it's not so much and I think that's changing, but we try and speak to the partners, we go on the phone, we say, how are you, how are you approaching this event? What's the uh, return on investment for that event? What did you find here? And so we, again, coming back to what I said at the beginning, knowing what we don't know, market research, and then working by numbers. Yeah, absolutely, and I think, there's, so to distill this in, in sort of summary, Number one, you have to look at the proposition of brand that you're offering and be proud of it. As I mentioned earlier on, when we're talking to a customer panel, we need to be able to talk about the solutions that we've done and the solutions that we're doing and share that with our customers. That is more value than telling them you've got HP 55,000 and it prints at 88,000 sheets a minute. Who gives a damn? Because everybody's got a Hokey Cokey 500 that prints at a thousand a minute and it's pretty. It's, it's talking about that solution and it might be the, th the services that you wrap around technology or hardware that make your business very special. So build that into a brand and a proposition. Be clear on what that proposition is to the customer. Work out some targets, a business plan that you want to get and what that looks like from a perspective and something that is owned right the way from the CEO right the way down to the guy that maybe stacks the paper in the machine. He might not be as motivated, but it's important he understands that there is a plan within the, the, in the business. Understand the target customers, what are the timelines to deliver that, and continue and grow that, that whole process. Can I just add a point, Douglas? Um, 100%, quick. mate. So Greg recently onboarded a customer in Canada where they were looking at buying a new Indigo, but they actually approached Infigo and said the words, we're looking at purchasing a new Indigo, Therefore, we need to have the revenue and drive the jobs to power that Indigo. So the mindset is slowly changing because, as Douglas mentioned, buy the Indigo first, worry about how you're going to drive the jobs to it later. So it's trying to get that planning before. So if you know you want to expand and you want that piece of kit, 
take a step back and how you're gonna feed that machine with jobs. Yeah, and, and just put, the, as I said again, the timelines and understand the metrics and have time, because this will take time to get an understanding of how many customers and what that looks like and, and, how, and how, how you're gonna manage and, and grow that success. Um, <clears throat> so the, the next big thing is, well, once we've really got that is, is, is going out and, and, and pushing that and, and selling it. And if we look at um, the, <clears throat> the different ways of doing this, there's lots of um, ways that we can do this. And I've, I've touched on a couple, whether it be social interaction, email, email lists are, are very successful for Infigo. We get a lot of our customers by generating lists, pulling that data together, working that data list as well. Um, and then being able to pull that social contact list is less, we've had less success from that. Um, but also previous people you engage with, just because they didn't work with you in, in, in the past, it doesn't mean that they won't um, build and deliver that. Making sure that you're push, putting that data into somewhere. Lots of us sit there with Excel lists and stuff like that, but actually building that into a framework. I mentioned HubSpot here. We use HubSpot. It's not the cheapest tool in the, in, in the marketplace but it is a very good tool. There's lots of others out there, but making sure that you're measuring and building in this information into the system. Um, and then you can use these tools to be able to easily go out and sequence and build interaction with these lists and stuff like that. You then obviously need to talk about some of the other things that we're discussing. So we know now how that we're gonna sell it. We've got a plan, we know the business plan. We know how many people are focused, are trained. Now we need to think about how we onboard it, how do we manage on the going, and then how do we scale um, that as well. So if we look at an onboarding, um, I don't know if, if you guys have ever thought about this, but it's something that we get pushed down our throats by my mentors and stuff from, from being a technology company, is how can we improve that onboarding process. Um, and at Infigo, we've challenged ourselves over the last two years um, that we're working and we're, we're definitely not the best at it yet, but we are getting amazingly better. We've taken on some new te technology, we've been taken on new people to improve that process. But actually, how, how do, what does that mean to a customer? If they've just signed a nice 200 grand order with you, what do they get? Who do they speak to? How do they work? And it's amazing uh, you, that that thought process goes out the window. So it's building an onboarding plan and it could be a single, simple document that says, when you deal with XYZ print or ABC labels, this is what happens, this is how you, these are your key contacts and, and, and things like that. But give a simple process map of how that customer will work with you. If they want to talk to you in the future and things like that. Then <clears throat> how, once you're starting to work with that, maybe they've got jobs, orders, you're building a site for them, they've got in process. How do they get updates and information about what's going on and, and, and things like that? So you need to be, able to think about that, use the CRM system to put in weekly, monthly, quarterly follow-ups. How's it going? Do you like, oh, Julie left. Oh, Julie's left, well, Julie rang the system. And often how we find that out is normally when that job disappears. Well, actually building in sequencing to say, right, we'll do that. And that could be via email. Hey, Julie, looks like it's personal. Just seeing how you're getting on. If you don't get a supply, the CRM system knows it's a phone call and, and things like that. And it's building in those um, ongoing PCs um, and stuff like that. And then how do we scale this? Well, <clears throat> you've had some great wins, you're onboarding, the customers are happy. How do, I've got 50 customers using the system, how do I get 100 and things like that? So you need to be able to put the proposition together and that ultimately is gonna come down to potentially budget. How am I gonna spend more money to drive more opportunity, more audience? Am I gonna visit, um, um, exhibitions, am I going to create a customer event that they can come and learn about our business and our process and things like that. But the uh, important thing is, is that you do build budget and a plan into that scale piece because often what customers do is they say, right, I've spent a million pound or half a million pound on my press, I've just spent 50 grand on my software, ah, oh, I've no money to market or grow or promote or whatever it is. So it's building in that once we get success because you can't go from 20 to 50 without investing and growing into that process and that requires putting in a budget. And to give you an idea, the top guys like a 
uh, an Uber or those crazy guys are probably spending anywhere between 10 and 15% of their revenue, their revenue on marketing. Now, if you look at that on the smaller scale, a business that's probably ticking over would be less than 3%, but a growth business has to be investing between five and 8% of their revenue into marketing. Don't tell Michael. <laughs> it's amazing when you actually start and look at it. And, and <clears throat> I visit a number of businesses like we've had success, we're winning, but we're not seeing growth. And, and there, is, there is no value, there's no impetus put between, excuse me, um, investing and growing this. And, 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 and without that, you're never gonna get to that um, scale and success um, piece. Any frameworks on, on, I, I, on the how and, and... Yeah, I was just gonna go back on your earlier points, actually. So Douglas mentioned email success versus social media success. So going back to his original point, that we do everything based on numbers and KPIs. We won't just post for the sake of posting. We are looking for some kind of um, outcome from it. Whereas with an email, we, we tend to see most um, leads coming from that channel. Funny enough, everyone thinks email's dead. It's not, but it's, it depends what you email and who you email. We tend to give away a lot of um, white papers, a lot of information, um, and there's a quick win and on the how do we scale, and I'd say how do we scale quickly, Doug, as, as, a, as a question, would be sending things to your customers. So if you know who your top 10 customers are, you should probably be sending them free assets once a month. Yeah. How to guides, telling them how they can do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, and a big, big one on that, Chris, is, and it's come up a lot over the last few months, um, and I was speaking to, I don't know, if it, Malcolm, is Malcolm in here? No. Um, earlier, and he was talking about how there's uh, an ec been an exodus over COVID in the last few months on people letting people go of um, skilled people that understand print. And a simple way that you could talk about, if you, were, if you think about buying print, you could do print guides, you could do these things, you could put it that behind a little email, click here to do that, it's simple ways or also talk about emailing out, we've just had this success, this customer um, using my web to print solution allowed them to scale, allowed them to sell more product. This is a success they had, click here to learn more about how they do that. And start to build these frameworks and these yeah. ideas. Um, and and, and if you start adding value and you build content, the relationship that you grow and build with these guys will be far, far greater when they actually come to do um, business with you. And as Greg said earlier, John the Plumbers, you know, we've seen customers in, in London that are doing very well that have really good B2C sites where they have 10 John the Plumber sites um, just with a PO payment system, standard templates. You know, again, it, your top 10 clients should all have a storefront, really. Um, should be sticking, kept locked in, so. Right, absolutely. So <clears throat> the last piece, but certainly not the last piece, is the review stage and that comes across all the different things that we've discussed um, around this. So number one, did we achieve the numbers that we set out um, and delivered within the business? Um, is the process working? And that could be working as the customer using the tools that you've given them. Are they interested in interacting with that? Could it be that the sales team are actually trained up and understand how and to, pu to push the process. The biggest one that I get all the time is, we've got this amazing solution. The customers that use it love it, but the sales guys don't know how to go and sell it. I then go and speak to the sales guy and say, well, we've never been trained to sell it. We've got no assets to go out and talk about it because they haven't built a brand and stuff like that. So that, that is the process working, comes across the different processes within the organization. And then once again, do we need to choose, do we need to change anything? The amount of web to print e-commerce solutions that have been the same for the last 10 years are incredible. Let me tell you, that customer has evolved and changed. So if you're not going in there and developing, their buyer needs are changing, how they interact, the skills of that. Um, we had one customer ring up and say, right, we're, we've got this site, Doug, absolutely terrible, your system's a load of shop. Beep. Beep. Um, we don't like it, we're getting rid of it. And I'm like, fantastic, I, I agree with you totally. Um, thank you very much for the call. And I was like, what's the problem? We had a chat with them. 
um, are that we're not getting adoption. We had loads of orders coming in. It's just it's just stopped. It must be something you guys have done in an update. Quick question. I, have a, oh, right. I said, out of curiosity, could I speak to the customer? And they're like, no, nah, you'll try and nick them. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to nick them. Trust me, I've got lots to do. Um, so we have a chat with the customer. We get, we, and <clears throat> what it was, it was a conduit within the business that had been trained up. They had moved on. They had left. And lo and behold, nobody had a login. What? God, my system is well shit. I should have known that. I should have understood. But is it a mental? But actually having that conversation and starting to do that. But if we'd built in reviews, if we'd built in things, you'd know the key users in the business. You'd inter understand how they interact with the software and you'd be able to continue to evolve and, and develop that. And that's <clears throat> really important because customers will change, the branding will change, you need to update that. And the fresher, the, the more interesting that um, you keep the system, um, the more they'll use it. It becomes like their internal, your internal marketing um, for them um, within that. But you need to be able to review these things at different stages um, and ultimately measure the success of the client. So ask the question, we work together to build a solution for you. Do you feel it's adding value to your business? Yes or no? Well, not really. Why? Well, we need to be able to do this. Oh, well, we can set up another product to do that. Ask the questions because you'll be amazed at the feedback that you get and you can be able to develop that. We, we work with a customer um, in, <coughs> um, oh, I'll try to think with it, a commercial print, but they do, essentially it's large format, but they get asked um, once a year, surprise, surprise, um, to do cards and, and other um, holiday style. And I was like, <clears throat> why don't you take that and offer it to all your customers? Why don't you put at Christmas the availability for all your customers to be able to order greeting cards or templates and stuff like that? I then said to him, whoa, why don't you put three or four products that they could upload files that are non-templated that you agree some standard pricing? Oh yeah, but we don't get that work. Let me tell you, you put that up there, you're going to start to get some of that work. So it's reviewing, agreeing the changes, looking at what the success is, and coming up with ideas. Agree them, and some of those changes might be internally within that business as well. And it might be, hey guys, right, these are the three things I'm going to do, these are the four things you're going to do, agree it, and have that conversation, lock it and load it, and in 30 days, 90 days, you've got a great customer. You go in, you agree, you don't have to take any, any donuts, you've saved three pounds at Dunkin's, and away you go um, for, the, for the next part. But then you've also got a key date in the diary for being able to engage and have that conversation with them um, at the next time. Anything to? I was just gonna say, obviously you developed this framework some time ago, so it's been tried and tested. But ultimately, what we've seen is it works well for you as the PSP, but also for your customers as well. So as Douglas was saying about review, you could offer this as part of the service to your customers and then hold them accountable in the review process as well. And it's like a two-way thing then as well. So there's, there's two ways you could use this, A, for your own business, and then B, for your customers' uh, projects as well. Excellent. So <clears throat> that, that's me. Any questions, thoughts, um, any Thing that I can help with. We, we now have a few minutes before we're going to go upstairs and get absolutely wasted. Um, that's not true, by the way. Uh, I have my car at the um, train station. Any questions, guys? Thoughts? Load of rubbish? Liked it? Some interesting stuff? Questions? No? Very quiet? Interesting? Provoking? Thought provoking? It's amazing. This is probably the most simplest stuff that we do, but it's just, I would say, 80% of businesses don't even think about it. Oh, no, sorry. 80% of them think about it. 20% of them will actually take the time and effort. And let me tell you, those 20% are the ones that say, oh, how do I be like that? And it is by taking frameworks like this and pushing it harder within their organisations. So thank you very much for your time. If there's no questions, I will close the session.